we have looked at spectral theorem in the last lecture the statement basically said that a normal matrix the definition of normal matrix was mm star is equal to m star m a normal matrix is equivalent to a matrix which has an orthonormal basis of eigen in other words, we have a characterization of what normal matrices are. They are exactly the matrices which have an orthogonal basis of eigenvectors. More importantly, we saw two important subclasses, Hermitian matrices. These are like symmetric matrices in real uh, matrices where M is equal to M star. The other ones are called unitary matrices. These are the ones where m star m is equal to identity. These Hermitian matrices are the ones which have real eigenvalues. Unitary matrices are the ones whose eigenvalues have a absolute value 1. The unitary matrices can also be thought of as basis change matrices. In today's lecture, we will use both these subclasses, Hermitian and Unitary matrices and that will define the second postulate. Do you remember what was the second postulate? It was supposed to talk about how does a quantum system evolve. The second postulate is supposed to answer this question. In other words, how does its or quantum system state change? We know what the state of a quantum system is by first postulate. It is a vector in a Hilbert space, but how does it change with time? This is what we want to understand. And many of you who are physics students already know the answer. Uh, the second postulate, I am saying, uh, I would say second postulate prime because we will just modify it so that it works better for quantum computing purposes, is also known as Schrodinger's equation, which I am sure many of you, not just students of physics, must have heard. And if you have not heard of Schrodinger's equation, you might have heard of Schrodinger's cat. Let's restrict ourselves to Schrodinger's equation. What is Schrodinger's equation? It says I d psi by dt is equal to h psi. What are the things here? The psi is the state of a closed system. So you see that this equation is a partial differential equation and shows how psi changes with time. This is what we wanted to answer and this partial differential equation exactly answers that question. This i is not the index variable as many computer scientists would assume. This is square root of minus 1 because we are in the complex domain. H is called the Hamiltonian matrix. For us, it will just be a Hermitian matrix. Let's write it once again. Now you know all the parts. Schrodinger's equation tells us how psi changes with time. You can uh, integrate it. Uh, uh, one small note, uh, you might be wondering where is the Planck's constant. So we have assumed that Planck's constant is absorbed in H. We will not worry about it much more. That's why uh, I am not going to devote much time into details of these things. 
uh, we are going to quickly come to the working second postulate. I'm going to describe it very soon and then stick with that. If you integrate this, uh, what you will get is that psi at t2, so let's say t1 and t2 are two times, then state at t2 is psi t2, time and state at time t1 is psi t1, then psi t2 is e to the minus ih t2 minus t1 psi t1. Notice that h is a matrix here and you might not know how to integrate an equation with matrices. At this point, trust your intuition and probably trust me a little bit that this is what you would get when you integrate this partial differential equation and you will solve this in partial differential equation. Notice this quantity e to the minus ih t2 minus t1. You know this is a matrix. I have taken a matrix h and applied an operator function on it. h is an operator and then I have applied e to the minus i t2 minus t1 h. This is the function I have applied on h and you know its meaning, right? In this case, it turns out that this matrix is unitary. Why is that true? You can look at the eigenvalues. You can easily show that if r is a real number, then e to the minus i r is a number with absolute value 1. And this shows that all the eigenvalues of e to the minus i t2 minus t1 h are going to have absolute value 1 and hence this matrix is a unitary matrix. Denoting this matrix e to the minus i h t2 minus t1 as u t2 comma t1 something which only depends on t2 comma t1 I can say that state at psi t2 is u t2 comma t1 psi t1. This gives us the working second postulate in the sense that this is what we will be using for quantum computing. What is the exact statement of working second postulate? It says a closed quantum system. We have talked about this fact that when we say closed quantum system, uh, it's not affected by any other system from outside. A closed quantum system evolves unitarily. Right? This is what it means the unitary matrix only depends on time t1 and t2. This is the postulate which we will be working with. So our gates, our operators inside the quantum computer are going to be unitary operators and that is not surprising. Because if you remember, our states were something which had length 1. So an operator or a gate should preserve this length 1 property. It should take a state to another state. That means our operators preserve length. And so we know which operators preserve length. These are unitary operators. This is what the working second postulate mentions. Let's look at some of the examples, some of the single bit gates which are unitary. Most famous ones are called poly matrices, X matrix 0, 1, 1, 0. This is also called poly X. 
if you look at the action, it takes 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. This is the not gate for us. You can look at the Z gate. This is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. What is its action? It takes 0 to 0. It takes 1 to minus 1. It puts a face of minus when the state is 1. This is also uh, called as the putting the face of minus 1 when the state is 1. If the state is 0, then it does not do anything. Uh, if you remember, uh, if the gate always puts a phase of minus 1, whether the state is 0 or 1, that gate is actually useless. This is something which we discussed when we talked about global phase and local phase. So, it's necessary that it only puts a minus 1 phase only when the state is 1. It should not put a phase of minus 1 on every state, then it won't be doing anything important. And y is minus i x z. It is, if you want to write as a matrix representation, it is this. You can calculate its action. Another very important gate, which we have already described, is called the header 1 gate. Its action, 0 goes to 0 plus 1 over root 2. This is also called a plus state. 1 goes to 0 minus 1 by root 2. This is known as the minus gate. These are the single bit gates which we will encounter again and again in the description of quantum computing. There are two bits gates also and actually the thing which I am going to describe is going to be very useful are called control gates. What are control gates? They have control qubits and data qubits. and they apply the unitary the unitary is applied only if control are in the on state it's a very natural way to describe a gate we only apply unitary this is applied if control asks us to, if control is on. What do I mean by control is on? Generally, control is on if all control qubits are 1. The simplest possible control gate is known as C0 case. Or now, since you know poly X matrix, it's also called Cx gate. What is it? It has one control qubit and one data qubit. And if you see what it will do, if the control bit is zero, then it will flip, it will not do anything to the data qubit. So if control is zero, don't do anything. If control is one, then flip data. This is known as C0 gate. It is represented by this. In general, you can have multiple uh, control qubits and multiple data qubits and this is how a CU gate will be represented. In the next week, we will study the third postulate which will tell us how to obtain information from a closed system. We know the state of a closed system. We know how a closed system evolves. The next step would be to gain information from this closed system. And that will be done by something called measurements. And they are described by the third postulate. Thank you.